All right, let's try that again. Hi, I'm nervous, and this is a disaster in the making. I thought it'd be cool to make some videos about books I've read, because as you'll soon find out, I could really use the practice in communicating effectively. And what better book to start off this project with than a modern fantasy novel my friends have already gotten dead tired of me recommending, Brandon Sanderson's The Final Empire. It sure doesn't get talked about enough. The Final Empire, also known as Mistborn, is the first novel in the Mistborn trilogy, which is itself only the first era of the larger Mistborn series. Since that's needlessly confusing, I'll just be calling it The Final Empire from now on. The first book's about how a gang of magical thieves go about robbing a tyrannical god. It's set in a well-realised world with a plot that's more nuanced than it first appears, and it has pretty solid characters, like Little Mistrustful, a dude that read The Prince once, and that guy from Fortnite. It has its flaws, for sure, too, but despite that it's now my go-to recommendation for for most people interested in picking up a modern fantasy novel, so hopefully I can help you decide if the book's something for you without spoiling too much of the story. If you've already read it, um, good for you? Why are you here? So a thousand years ago, a prophesied hero supposedly saved a world from the deepness, and subsequently implemented a brutal totalitarian regime. Yeah, that checks out. Now Skadriel's feudal landscapes are painted black with ash, the dense clouds blocking out the stars. All life is tainted by these conditions. Animals have to dig below the regularly falling ashes for nutrient-rich plants, which in turn look brown, sickly, and never bloom. The final empire's fields are worked by the Scar, downtrodden serfs ruled over by the nobility, who are in turn subject to the god emperor himself, the Lord Ruler. And for a name that city to inspire fear, he's got to be one bad dude. Some noblemen also have access to Alamancy, a hereditary magical art bestowed upon them by this god that grants specific powers upon the consumption of metals, which, yes, is about as healthy as it sounds. Considering its hereditary nature, the Empire sees to it that noble and scar blood never mixes. Officially. But the Empire's iron hold on the Scar underclass is not as secure as it may first appear. In the underworld of the capital city Luthadel, a survivor returns to his crew of criminal friends. Scarred yet smiling, he carries with him new powers and a new purpose. With another Alamancer added to their ranks, the group collude with Scar rebels to pull their most daring Promethean heist. They'll rob God himself. Or, well, his treasury, anyway. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the characters. Kelsey. Kels? Kelsey. Uh. Oh, what the? Kel is the aforementioned leader of this thieving crew, who is said to have gotten captured due to his wife's betrayal. As they both are worked to death in the slave pits of Hathsin, he discovers his own hidden abilities as a powerful Alamancer, a Mistborn. <laughs> I'll explain exactly what that means in detail later, but suffice it to say, he's a badass now. Kel's very active in the story, and I think that's one of the main reasons people like him. He rebuilds the crew, plans the heist with Scar Rebels, and manages the execution. It's also interesting how he's unable to fully process the betrayal of his beloved, and goes about his schemes competently, charismatically, and ruthlessly. In addition, he serves as a mentor figure in contrast to another protagonist, a street urchin named Vin. Vin. Vin will probably make or break this book for you. We meet her as a streetwise child in another thieving crew, to which her brother has abandoned her by, you guessed it, betraying her. Mistreated as she is by her crewmates, she's learned to keep her head down, and be very mistrustful of everyone she meets. Yet the leader keeps her around as something of a good luck charm. He also seems to think he needs to beat the luck out of her. It turns out, Kelsey had outsourced a job to this gang, and he offers Vin an opportunity when he notices her peculiar talent. She of course doesn't trust him as far as she can stab him, which isn't that far because she's short and malnourished, but she cautiously accepts. And so we follow Vin as she gets swept along in Kelsey's schemes. The crew of mostly misfit mistings treats her with kindness, something so foreign to Vin she remains very mistrustful of them, yet she finds herself liking them despite her edge. She then discovers that she too is a Mistborn. <laughs> She of course also has a role to play in the coming ploy. It is her task to infiltrate noble society with another plant, and to this end the crew prepares and trains her. So yeah, I'd say the emotional core of her story is how she struggles with her mistrust of people. Given her origin, I think it's a realistic flaw, and it does much to avoid Suna creeping in as she slowly starts to become more competent. Her status and talent as a mistborn, her sneaky thieving and spying skills, and the cool dudes in the crew almost immediately taking a liking to her did on occasion make me roll my eyes. In annoyance, not jealousy, shut up. And now that we're talking about the flaws that ground her character, let's briefly talk about Elend. Elend is a young nobleman, charming but a bit of a wuss. He likes to spend his days reading about history and philosophy, discussing grand societal reforms with his close friends, and being an utter disappointment to his father. In other words, a stereotypical millennial born almost entirely into the wrong generation if it weren't for the tomboy crushing on him. 
So Vin meets this absolute muffin at a ball, and we get to enjoy awkward teenage romance. This romantic subplot is... Well, I thought it was kind of mediocre at this stage. Elend is a fine character, and being from a very different background, he's fun to read, but Vin's quick crush on him felt very sudden when I first read it. It doesn't help that Elend is already engaged, and hey... Look, it gets better, but it's not a great start. That said, the other side characters are great. Sure, they don't get as much development as what I would dub the book's main trio, but they're each unique and reasonably believable people with some depth to them. Everyone in the crew, from Kelsey's more practical right-hand man, Doxon, who has great organisational skills but notably no allomantic power, to Breeze, a laid-back soother who uses allomancy all the time to mind-trick others into doing stuff for him, get their own small arcs over the course of the story. While Vin, Kelsey and Ellen are all decent characters in their own right, it was some of the supporting cast that really kept me in interested in reading when the story slowed down, which, um... Brandon Sanderson's writing can be an absolute roller coaster, by which I mean you'll spend what feels like 80% of the ride slowly getting dragged up the ramp. But after this slow build-up, you may get a bunch of fast twists and turns in the book's finale that make the ride as a whole very much worth it. This analogy isn't perfect, there's plenty of action throughout the entirety of the book, but it does sag a bit in the middle. With the heist plans, political intrigue, Vince training, and her relationship subplot all happening at once, it can feel like none of those things are progressing at a decent pace. The narrative focus is on Vin and Ellen at this point, who don't move the main plot forward much Either. Then Kelsey kicks it back into gear about halfway through and we're back on track with the descent coming up. The characters and world are still interesting throughout this part and the book as a whole, but as Kelsey's plan is often going quite smoothly out of sight, the tension can suffer a bit. That ending though. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's really good, but younger me would disagree. The story outwardly presents itself in a fairly predictable package, but there are undercurrents of doubt and greater implications that I kinda ignored on my first reading. You can probably guess what happens in a story where a bunch of misfits team up to topple an evil regime. That's not to say the basic story is bad by any means, but much of the praise I have for it is due to its consequences and later recontextualization. The book's basically full of twists hidden in a more straightforward tale. I'll... yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. The prose too is serviceable. Sanderson's prose is kind of like a peanut butter sandwich. It's fine and will get you through the day, but it's nothing special. You wouldn't brag to your friends that you ate a peanut butter sandwich for dinner, even though that's totally fine and nothing to be ashamed of doing occasionally when you can't be bothered to cook. The simple style will turn some people off, but I wouldn't say it detracts from the story much. It's a perfectly fine backbone to his books, but not really anything to write home about either. A highlight of the final empire, however, is its world building. The consequences of the mopey setting are never forgotten and play crucial roles in this story. The environment, political factions, religions, economy, and magic are all intertwined, which makes the Lord Ruler's final empire surprisingly immersive. Small character interactions are used to reveal deeper and more specific details about the world, like in the crew's Thug Hammond sophisticated chats with Breeze, or the eunuch says its attempts to help Kelsa deal with the loss of his wife. Highlighting detail anchors the setting well, and makes discovering the world a blast. A great example of this, which we can now finally get to, is Alamancy, or how to eat metals and get magic powers. We promise these aren't mercury poisoning induced hallucinations, no no no, you're a powerful wizard. Honest. We gradually learn about it with Vin as we follow her training with the crew's mistings and then see a reply apply its rigid system in innovative ways. Alamancy has strict rules to it, and by forcing the characters to act within this framework, we know what problems they can and can't solve through magic. For example, there are 10 alamantically active metals and thus 10 flavours of misting mages. Each can consume only one specific metal to get one specific power. A coin shot misting can eat steel to yeet metal objects, while a seeker can chew on some bronze to feel out alamancy being used in their vicinity. The exception to this are the Mistborn, rare alamancers that can burn every metal, and thus have access to all of these powers. This all works very well to create tense actions scenes of which this book has quite a few. These rules, however, are fundamentally just observations made over the course of centuries, and who is to say they reflect the whole truth of magic? What, for example, are these tales of an eleventh metal that Kelsey spins? The Final Empire has the benefit of the reader knowing what magic can and can't do, but also lets them and the characters discover more applications as the story progresses. I can hardly stress enough how much I enjoyed this aspect of the book and series. Connecting the dots was so much fun, and it's used for great foreshadowing as well, to the point that you can already call twists that happen in the final book of the trilogy if you pay attention. Now, I know this section is high school book report tier, but I might as well practice for when I eventually start talking about more highbrow novels. It seems to me that The Final Empire, and Brandon's writing as a whole, often touches lightly upon many themes and subjects, and more deeply on a few across many of his books. So, um, here's three to look out for, maybe. 
For sure, this is the most obvious one, right? Vince's character arc is largely focused on her learning to extend her trust to those worthy of it. She doesn't trust Kelsa or the crew much at all at first, and only sticks around as Kelsa promises to teach her about her powers. Kelsa isn't necessarily a character deserving of all that much trust either, which makes those dynamics interesting enough. It shows up in Vince's relationship with Ellen, in Kelsa with the crew, and so on and so forth. Its mirror image, Betrayal, is also omnipresent, and the characters often reckon with both. Few of the facts as they are presented in The Final Empire, and really the first Mistborn trilogy as a whole, are quite as they appear at first, and lacking in alternative explanations. But I obviously can't give any examples of that sort of thing for spoiler reasons, so… Themes around belief and religion appear in all of Brando's books insofar as I've read them, and this one's no exception. From the orthodox faith of Ruli the God Emperor, to Says its scattered knowledge of Skadriel's old religions, and from a myriad of bleak prophecies to high hopes for the future, the hopes, dreams, or lack of either deeply influence the characters throughout the whole series. Brando himself is a Mormon, and while you can definitely tell his religion influences his writing in parts, I've yet to find a takeaway from the stories. Man, I should really start to wrap this up with a summary of sorts. Let's see. The characters are all serviceable enough, with the main trio receiving decent development, while the supporting cast is mostly interesting. The world building's very good, though it may take one or two books to see everything pay off. The plot's a similar story, a fresh take on a classic, though it gets a bit tangled up in the middle and experiences one stumble in the final sprint. Brando's technical writing is bland, but a good support for the story, and the themes too are consistent, if not always very subtle. That leaves us at an arbitrary 8.1. My recommendation to buy it should be no surprise at this point. The audiobook, read by Michael Kramer, is also very solid. I've tried to mostly judge this book on its own, and while it definitely holds up that way, it shines brightest in the context of the larger Mistborn series. So why not pick up the first trilogy if you're interested? If you've made it through all this, you either are or might have forgotten this video still playing. Speaking of, if you've already read The Final Empire and loved it, here's a bonus recommendation. The Lies of Loch Lamora by Scott Lynch, the first book in his Gentleman Bastard series. Like the title implies, we're following a group of thieves in this one too, involved in an escalating underworld power struggle in the marine merchant city of Camor. The plot may not be as tight as The Final Empire's, but I certainly prefer this book's prose, dialogue, and characters overall. I prefer Mistborn in terms of where the series goes later, but the lower magic setting of Gentleman Bastards is something I gravitate towards. If that sounds interesting to you, maybe consider looking into finding a copy? It'll probably take a while before I get around to making a video on it. The script for this one took me nearly half a year to write and it's still pretty mediocre, so if you've got any thoughts on where I messed up this time around, or how I might improve more quickly, don't hesitate to toss me a comment. What else? Um, I did the music for this, so if you think that's cool, uh, stick, stick around for more, maybe. I'll, I'll just cut it here and hope that works.